Uh, good morning. It's uh, good to be with you again uh, from a rather damp and dismal uh, Britain or Wales, should I say. Um, thank you to Irene for doing our reading from uh, Matthew chapter 6. It's a chapter I think we all know very well. Um, and it's a prayer that, of course, Jesus gave to his disciples and followers. And if you remember, it was a prayer that we always said at more in, in the morning at school assembly. A prayer most churches will include in the worship aspect of their service. And a prayer, I guess we can all say off by heart, uh, because we've become accustomed uh, to it. And the words therefore flow naturally from our lips. But do we ever stop to consider what we are actually saying? what the words actually say to us as Christians. And there's so much in this prayer to reflect on. So what we're going to do this morning is just take the first stanza uh, for our meditations, okay? Uh, six words and six simple headings to guide our thoughts from the opening of this prayer in verse 9. Our Father, which art in heaven. What does the word Father say to you? Well, let's have a look. First, to me, the Father speaks of relationship. It speaks of love, joy, peace, pleasure, security, help, hope and so much more. It speaks of a son's relationship uh, to his father. We are speaking of a heavenly relationship and an earthly relationship. And if you read Jesus' prayer apart on the mountain of John 17 and then consider his cries from the cross, you begin to appreciate the depth of the relationship that Jesus had with his Father. For Jesus to use this familiar term was a revelation and such a blessing as it made the God of heaven, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the God of the Old Testament, so real and so personal to us. Jesus brought his father, can we say, within touching distance for every one of us. He is only a prayer away. The song, Open Our Eyes, we want to see Jesus, to reach out and touch him and say that we love him springs readily to mind, doesn't it? But it was because of Jesus and his death upon the cross that we are able to say and to mean those words and call God our Father. Because of our salvation, you and I have been adopted into God's family and so we're allowed to call him our Father. Father. Romans 8 says that we have received the spirit of adoption and so we can cry Abba Father which is even more personal as it literally means Daddy. Now in John 20 and verse 17 Jesus speaking with Mary says I go to my go to my brethren and say to them I ascend unto heaven to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. That was the message Mary had to deliver to the disciples. And that's so special, you know, because it embraces us. Don't ever consider or take your relationship with God lightly. It is a truth that the world knows nothing about. And I would say that many Christians haven't fully appreciated the truth of it either. I guess we could all say we are learning more each day and that's a lovely thought. I should be closer to God today than when I first trusted in Jesus. I hope you would agree with that. James 4 verse 8 says that when we draw close to God, he will draw close to us. You have access to God's throne of grace 24 hours a day. The Bible says that he that keeps Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. So Hebrews 4 
verses 15 and 16, become very precious to us as Christians. He can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. We can come to his throne of grace. It's a place of mercy. It's a place of help in time of need. So Father speaks to us firstly of relationship. Secondly, Father speaks to us of rule and respect. We are well aware of this thought as we were all children at one, one time. Sorry about that if you saw it on the screen. Um, so yeah, we were all children at one term, time and of course many of us are still parents and we still have children. Of course now we have grandchildren. But we are also the children of a father in heaven. So just the word of the father, just as that goes in the earthly home, so to the word of our heavenly father goes in our earthly home too. And we better get used to it, you know, because one day it will certainly be true in heaven. In Exodus 20 and verse 2, you remember uh, the commandments, uh, honour thy father and thy mother. That's what it says. And we don't dispute that. We know it's right. We've proved it's right. The book of Proverbs gives a positive uh, support to that principle. Now then, in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 1, it says we are to follow God as dear children in exactly the same way as you expect your children to follow you as parents. So it means that we're not just to acknowledge God, but to have a reverence for God. Can I say even a reverence that brings us to our knees? In the Old Testament, it was a reverential fear. They stood in awe of God. Moses asked for something special from God uh, to give him reassurance of God's presence in Exodus chapter 33. Um, and I want you to know this, that he, Moses was asking for a reassurance of God's presence and call. And I say as if the burning bush wasn't enough, he wanted more. And this is what we find in Exodus 33. I'll just read snippets from it. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff neck. No, sorry, I'm reading from chapter 32. Forgive me, I go to 33 and verse 9. As Moses entered into the tabernacles, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord talked with Moses. The Lord spake to Moses face to face, as a man speaketh, unto his friend and this is what Moses said now therefore I pray thee if I have found grace in thy sight show me now thy way that I may know thee and I may find grace in thy sight and consider that this nation is thy people and God said my presence shall go with thee and I will give thee rest in verse 18, uh, Moses said, I beseech me thee, show me thy glory. And then in verse 20, God said to him, Thou canst not see my face, for shall no man see it and live. And the Lord said, Behold, and I love this thought, here there is, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass when my glory passes by, that I will put thee in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover thee with my hand while I pass by, and will take my hand, take away my hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, and my, but my face shall not be seen. Now there was Moses asking God for to feel and to know the reality of His presence, and he was only allowed to see the hinder parts of God as he stood in the cleft of that rock. Now that was something very special for Moses. Something he could tell his grandchildren. Uh, you can hear the words, can't you? Listen, children, I want to tell you something you won't believe. 
On the Sabbath day, I went to church and God spoke to me personally. Let me tell you what he said to me. You can imagine it happening. Uh, incidentally, do you actually share things with your grandchildren or your children of what God speaks to you? Maybe you think our children are too old. And yet I find with my son, I can still say to him, Richard, can I just share with you something that I learned from the Lord, you know, this past week? It's so personal and it's so helpful to your children to know this. Now, the reverential awe of the Old Testament, I don't think is present today. We tend to think God as more of a chum or a, a buddy. We bring him down to our level. And you know that's led to our undoing many times. And I would suggest to you that the reverential fear of the Old Testament is in the New Testament a reverential love and worship. In practice this means doing my Father's will, being obedient. That's what the rule and respect means. I wonder do you ever think of what it means to be obedient to God? He is the sovereign of our lives. He is the Alpha and Omega. And Hebrew, in Hebrews 12 it says he's the author and the finisher of our faith. Do you therefore believe that God has a purpose and plan for your life? Well, like me, you must do. Because the Bible says so. Jeremiah 29, 11, Philippians 3 and of course Romans 12, 1 and 2. Now Jesus said, I do always those things that please him, speaking of his father. And we are called to follow in his steps, 1 Peter 2, 21. And when I look back and see what God has done in my life, you know, I'm so glad that I fitted into his plans, um, and not him trying to fit God into my plans. And I, I quoted these verses before, but they're worth repeating to you on the subject of obedience. And it says this in 1 John 2, verses 3 to 6. It is only when we obey God's laws that we can be quite sure we really know him. In practice, the more a man learns to obey God's laws, the more truly and fully does he express his love for him. The life of the man who professes to be living in God must bear the stamp of Christ. And yes, I have had some ups and downs in my, my life, uh, just as you have. But not for one moment uh, would I say I have doubted God or regretted my walk with God. And I can thank him for all the way that he has led me for over 70 years now. I stress to you the importance, therefore, of respect uh, in our relationship with God. Now, how we maintain that, of course, is another message. Suffice it to say that Romans 5 and verse 2 in the Living Translation says this, He has brought us into this place of highest privilege where we now stand, and we confidently and joyfully look forward to actually becoming all that God has had in mind for us to be. Now it's such a tremendous verse to think about. God is working out his purposes in your life. Being confident of this very thing that he that has stood, started a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So relationship and respect. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he promises he will direct your steps. Thirdly. The Father speaks of reach, reach. We said earlier that God reaches out and he embraces all of us. How often do you feel, oh, I just need a hug or I just need a word of encouragement? Now, to understand this thought, I want you to look into the Gospels in John chapter 10. And this emphasises the special relationship that the sheep have with the shepherd. But notice please what Jesus says in verse 16 of John 10. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, 
and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. It's a lovely passage, the whole of it. But one thought captures the attention in this verse. Other sheep have I. Now that tells me that Jesus already has these sheep. But they aren't yet in his fold. They need to hear his voice. And here's the wonderful part. That God, that Jesus asks us to help him. Ah, you know, that's amazing to me. That he, he draws us into what he's seeking to accomplish in the world. And that's why he calls us co-laborers together with Christ. We, you and I, are to be his voice to these lost souls. And, and let's face it, they are lost. This epidemic, epidemic has evidenced the fear that has been there. Through you and me and the inner working of his Holy Spirit, God is seeking to rescue these lost souls, these lost sheep, and bring them into his fold, his kingdom. And it's all done through the cross. You see, God's family is a worldwide family. And there are many ways to meet Jesus. But they all have to come via the foot of the cross. We are called, therefore, the household of God. And you know, in the Lord's Prayer, you don't find one personal pronoun. You do find it is our ours, we, us. It's a family. We are all embracing. We are his church, the body of Christ. So whereas we come to know God personally, he grafts us into the true vine of John 15 and he accepts us uh, into his family, Ephesians 1, 6. So we can now sing, we are the family of God. And this is our family prayer. And we're now able to say our Father with some meaning. But God is still reaching out into our world, even would you believe into our community, our families, to bring them to Jesus. And we need to pray that we would be his channels of blessing, sharing the truths of the gospel message with them. He wants you to have a vital, life-changing part and this is what I believe makes the Christian life so exciting. It is filled with expectancy. And this is how God is going to grow his church, you and me. There is a lot more we could say about how this is to be achieved. That's another message. But the key question is this. Are you involved now? Is God reaching out through you and through me? Fourthly, the father speaks of residence. Families have a home and God is no different. His home is in heaven. Psalm 115 verse 3 tells us that and from there he rules the world with power and authority. Psalm 113 verse 4 says, The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Solomon says, the heaven of heavens cannot contain God. And this is what makes it so exciting and so wonderful. And there are many times when the psalmist is at a loss for words to try and describe God, his home, his glory. And by far the clearest pictures that we get are from Jesus himself in John 14. In my father's house there are many mansions. And it is there that Jesus has gone to prepare a place for you and for me. Then John in Revelation 21 and 22 gives us the second picture of the wonder and the glories of heaven. Certainly something for the Christian to look forward to. Now, Dr. Herbert Lockyer, um, he's gone to be with the Lord now. But um, he was a guy who... Um, I heard speak in Birkenhead uh, when I was a 15-year-old lad and he talked about total commitment to the Lord um, and at the age of 15, I, I, it was a day when I knelt by my bed when I got home and committed my life 100% to God. Now, that's by the by. Um, he was talking about heaven and he says, there is a country 
without sin, crime, lawlessness, bloodshed, disease, death, sorrow or heartache. He says that place is heaven. And he went on to say there are no barriers, no walls or curtains to divide. There are no race barriers, no soldiers because there's no wars, no policemen because there's no crime, no undertakers because there's no death, there's no graves, no physicians, germs, fevers, pestilences, disease, disability are all unknown in heaven. No thieves because there's no darkness. Now, who will not yearn for this better and more desirable country where there's no hate, anger, lying, gossip, pain, no separations, no divorce, no broken homes, no drunkards, no sexual abuse, no prisons, no hospitals, no old folks home, no homelessness, no blind, deaf, dumb, disabled or destitute people. What a country. For travel agents offering this, business would be booming. It's one you would choose, I'm sure, and so do I. Well, the Bible clearly teaches there is a place called heaven. And it's a place that's reserved for those who've trusted Jesus Christ as the Saviour, as their Saviour and Lord. And as John 15, 14 says, um, it's prepared for us. Do you have that assurance that you are going to be uh, with the Lord Jesus? Well, let's move on. In Acts 1, Jesus ascended into heaven. And one day he's going to come back again, as he promised in John 14. And as the angel promised in John, Acts 1 verse 11. Uh, ye men of Israel, why stand ye gay looking up into heaven? Uh, this same Jesus is going to come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Those promises sustain the Christian. That is our hope. And when he comes, he comes first for his ransomed church. And will receive us unto himself. And he will present us to his father, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that we should be holy and without blemish. Ephesians 5, 26 and 27. Now, the word to present means to place beside. And now here's another truly wonderful fact to think about. The fulfilment of that thought, to place beside, is that the church will become the bride of Christ in Revelation chapter 19. One day God will be calling his church home and he will send his son, the Lord Jesus, to gather his children from the four corners of the world and we will be married to the Lord Jesus. And his residence, therefore, naturally leads us to our next thought, which we just touched on. 1 Thessalonians 4 speaks of the rapture of the church. It's all recorded in God's plan for the church. We will all get that Elijah experience of being caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord's. These are words that calm the anxious soul. They soothe the troubled breast. They give hope to the Christian. And there'll be a big sign Welcome home, just like it was for the prodigal son in Luke 15. This is something to really look forward to. Great expectations, you might say. And don't forget that the rapture precedes the second coming of Christ. So the Lord's Prayer is both personal and it's a family prayer. It speaks of relationship. It speaks of rule and respect. It speaks of the Father reaching out. Then we looked at our residence, our rapture. And when we finally have to consider, well, what effect is this going to have on my life? How do these thoughts impact my life right here and now? We prayed, thy kingdom come. And our minds were naturally turned to the new Jerusalem, the new heavens and the new earth wherein dwells righteousness. And that's what awaits us all who are saved and have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. We actually look for his glorious appearing, residence and rapture. But the focus must be on our lives right now. What is God really saying to you and to me? 
What is it that excites you? What is it that's motivating you? What's grabbing your heart at this moment? In our lives, families, friendships, community, are so many people who do not know Jesus as their Saviour like you and I do. Many who cannot honestly and truthfully say, Our Father. Lives we are often touching on a daily basis, and that's our final point as we come to a close. Father speaks of our relationship, uh, our rule and respect. It speaks of our um, residence. It speaks of our rapture. But it speaks of our responsibility. We can't run away from this, can we? God is now reaching out, and this was our third point, when we agreed that he's reaching out through you and through me. And think about this, please. He's got no one else. He depends on you and he depends on me. And we mustn't let him down. You see, we are the witnesses of what we have seen and heard, just like those disciples were. We do have a story to tell to the nations that will turn their hearts to the Lord. And it's a personal one. You are unique. No one has a testimony like yours. Sharing how you came to know Jesus and how he stepped in and saved you. So may I ask you the question as we close. If someone came and asked you, would you please tell me how you became a Christian? What would you say? My pastor, and I'm going back to my youth here, took me on board ships in Liverpool docks. And he took me there so that we could share the gospel with sailors. And he didn't stand by me. He let me get on with it. And, and you know, it did so much for my Christian life. I was just 15 years of age at the time. I remember we used to travel on his Lambretta scooter. Anyway, that was quite a challenge. But what happened next was an even greater challenge for me. As we stood on the pier head at an open air meeting, 250 dockers were listening as he shared the gospel. And then he said, now I've got a young guy here. And I want him to tell you how, became, how he became a Christian. The, the earth could have opened and swallowed me up at that stage. But I did it. And it was, I got such a thrill out of doing it afterwards, although I was quaking in my shoes at the time. Um, and it, it's your testimony, you see. Uh, and that's what's so important. They were exciting days for me. And you'd be amazed at the journey of faith that I have had. It's all in my testimony, as it is in yours, from when I trusted Christ at nine years of age and 72 years later, um, I'm still walking with the Lord and still saying the same, same message. You know, one of the most exciting things that I know of as a Christian is actually leading a person to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as their saviour. And you know what? When you do, you feel something special. Probably you've guessed it. You feel like a parent. You feel like you've got a responsibility for them. You are there for them, to help them to grow in their Christian lives. I don't know whether you know, but when I was 22 years of age, I was um, asked to go and help on a witnessing trip to Loughborough University. Uh, it was a wow of a weekend, I must say. Starting that weekend and in the following year, 300 students came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their saviour. We were so excited about what had happened. A short while later, we found out that two ladies at Quorn Baptist Church had been praying for over 10 years for those students at Loughborough University. Wow. But note this, 
God answered their prayers. So it tells me we must be praying for God's blessing on everything we do in outreach for the Alpha course and other methods and particularly for those personal conversations we have. Persistence pays off. And don't forget this, that it's God himself who is asking you for your help. You can have a part. Do you want to join in? Friends, as we close, God is our Father. And we've now looked at six precious thoughts to us as Christians. That Father speaks of relationship. It speaks of rule and respect. It speaks of reach. It speaks of residence. It speaks of the rapture. And it speaks of responsibility. One day we will meet the Lord Jesus face to face. And we'll sing the story, saved by grace. But remember, in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10, it says that one day we will have to give an answer to God. Give an account for our lives to God himself. We are saved to serve. I really want you, God to bless you and encourage you, and he will. He wants you and me to have a part in turning the world upside down for Jesus. Can we do it? Yes, we can. We have a God that can do the impossible. He did it in the book of Acts. He did it in those revivals of the 30s. And he can do it again. A little turn on the verse. I have not seen nor hear, ear heard. Neither hath entered into the heart of man what God can do through a life that is committed to him. Let's pray. God our Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that you have brought us and taught us this new song to sing unto him that has loved us and washed us from sin. Unto him be the glory for ever. Amen. And Father, we know that you have called us to serve you. And we pray, Lord, that you will help us on a day-by-day -day basis to seize those opportunities to tell others about Jesus. Oh, Lord, we want them to be brought into the fold of the Lord Jesus Christ. So please help us, and the glory will be yours. In Jesus' name, amen.